Hey, good morning, church. How you doing? Hey, come on. Let us stand this morning. Let's worship the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. Yes, we turn to him. We turn to you.
y'all are having a seat this morning and we enter into a time of prayer, I want you to do me a favor. Because while it is our absolute intention to sing Christ and Christ crucified, to be mission driven every single day of the year, I believe that the week of Easter presents us with a unique opportunity in our community while minds are on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to be absolutely intentional about inviting that people might hear the gospel and that lives might be transformed. So I want you to grab your Easter invite card. And as you do, I want to introduce you to a few friends. We have Ryan and Melanie J. And the very first time you came to Highland Heights was Easter this past year. And we're praising God for all the things that he's done Amen. in your lives. We want you to know that. So I have sent you a few questions. And the first question is simply this. How did you get an Easter invite to Highland Heights? Well, it's, it's really a story so simple. It sounds so simple. You could almost miss God in it if you weren't looking for him. Um, and if I may call somebody out here, um, Wendy Ames. Thank you, Wendy. There you go. Uh, she was our oldest daughter's kindergarten teacher last year. And as she prayed on who to invite for Easter Sunday, she decided to invite the whole class. Mm -hmm. um, not knowing where the seeds would land, she was just sowing. Come on. And we accepted the invite, and here we are. There you go. Well, what are a few ways over the past year that you've seen God move in your lives? Well, it's a pretty long list, <laughs> um, but for the sake of not being long-winded, because isn't that your job? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> He's got jokes. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is probably a serious moment. Um, <laughs> It's just been a major heart change. Um, I'm, I'm not the person that I was a year ago. You can ask anybody who knew me a year ago. I'm a more joyful person, a kinder and gentler person. Since we've been here, we've both been baptized. Amen. We've seen our oldest daughter be baptized Amen. and our youngest wanting to do so as well. Mm. Um, it's just been a whole new world for us. Amen. Come on. So Melanie, as we enter into a time of prayer, what would you share with our church members, the ones who are looking at this card going, I don't know who to invite, I don't know how to invite, how would you encourage them this morning? Yeah, I would say just be bold. Mm -hmm. As followers of Christ, we have a responsibility to lead others to Christ. Mm -hmm. And you could just simply start by inviting someone that's maybe not a follower of Christ, but maybe they have some questions. Maybe mm -hmm. they're curious. And your invite could be the encouragement that they need to just simply accept that invite and come to church on Sunday. It could be someone like Ryan and I that were trying to find a new church, and that can be honestly very intimidating and a bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But just say to someone, hey, I'd love for you to come with me to church on Sunday. I'll save you a seat. And that could be just the encouragement that someone needs um, to, to come to church. Um, it could just one invite can change someone's life. Amen. And Amen. Just, just as it's changed our life, um, Highland Heights is just the piece that was missing to our puzzle, honestly. Mm. Man. Church family, God wants to use you in his mission to reach everyone in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all over the world. And a lot of times, we get nervous. We don't know what to do, and so we don't do anything instead of being bold, like you said. 
So I wanna invite you into this time of prayer this way, church family. Maybe you already know who you want to invite to Easter, and I'm gonna invite you to pick up that little piece of paper. I want you to pray over it in all seriousness this morning. I want you to pray over it, over the person that you want to invite. And maybe you don't know the person that you want to invite. I want you to pick up that piece of paper and I want you to pray over it that over the next week, maybe you put it in your, your purse, maybe you put it in your car, maybe you put it in a jacket, but put it somewhere where you have access to it that when the moment comes, you can be bold and you can extend an invitation, an invitation to come to church leading to an invitation to trust Jesus, leading to an invitation to grow in their faith, an invitation that can change lives. We'll give you time to pray this morning. Jesus, as you began your earthly ministry by the Sea of Galilee, you extended an invitation to some guys who weren't even looking for it. You said, come and follow me. Their world was flipped upside down. Their lives were flipped upside down. And through them, you flipped the world upside down. An invitation. Father, in your word tells us that you have given us as followers of Jesus the ministry of reconciliation. A ministry that often begins, like your ministry, with invitation to come and experience the presence and the power, the word, your word, the worship, the love, the family that is right here at Highland Heights. God, open up our eyes that we might see our ears that we might hear. Prompt us by your spirit that we might know who to extend an invitation to and then make us bold to be faithful and obedient. Jesus, we love you and we want others to love you too. So we invite, especially as we come upon Easter Sunday. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you so much. Church, will you stand with us and let's continue to worship. The vocal team's gonna ask you a question this morning and I'm gonna ask you to respond. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen?
blessing and honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Father, we humbly come before you this morning, lifting up your name, the name that is above every name. Lord, this morning, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to approach your throne. We are so unworthy. But God, you are worthy of all praise, blessing, honor, and glory. God, we're grateful for your love this morning. God, we're thankful that we can gather together as a group of people, as brothers and sisters through you. We can open up your word and dig into the scriptures this morning to grow closer to you, but Lord, to be more prepared to step out of this room and go into a community that needs to hear the gospel, that needs to hear you. God, may we be bold in our faith, not just this week, but every day of every week. God, thank you for the life-changing power of the gospel. And Lord, now as we do open up your word, God, as we dig into the scriptures, God, may we lean into what is being taught. God, may this not be a time just to sit back and recline, but God, may we sit on the edge of our seat and take in what is being taught this morning. Thank you for your scriptures, Father, for your word. May we learn from them this morning. In your precious and matchless name I pray, amen. We train faithfully in the present, looking at his appearance and work in the past, waiting eagerly and expectantly to his future coming. One thing especially important I took away from Winter Weekend is how Christ is the ultimate foundation, base that we should build our lives on. If we count on this world to hold us up, whatever it may be, it will fail us. But God being the center of our lives cannot fail. To build ourselves up in the foundation of Christ means for his word to be at the center of our lives. Praying according to the spirit means giving priority to his will and not our own. Man, I am so excited about uh, Easter. I, I will let you know, I, I am so excited and ready for this next week. Uh, lots of opportunities to be inviting. And then on Good Friday, I want to let you know that there's going to be a unique opportunity to worship. We're going to tell you about that uh, a little bit later uh, in the service this morning. Just a few announcements at the end. But a unique opportunity to worship on Good Friday. We hope that you and your family will participate in. And then I'm excited for Easter Sunday as we get to celebrate. Listen, we celebrate the resurrected, the King Jesus every single week here at Highland Heights, but I love Easter Sunday, just the excitement and the celebration that comes along with it. But I'm also excited this morning to wrap up the book of Jude. We've been in this book for about five weeks and, and we've been plunging its depths and, and I, I believe there's a little bit more to go and I, I'm excited to open back up the book of Jude with you this morning. And as you turn with Jude, to Jude with me, I, I want you to be thinking about something. Anybody play football like in high school or, or college or something like that? Y'all played football? Y'all have football players? I don't know. So I played football um, when I was uh, in high school, loved playing football growing up. And I remember one particular time where I was on special teams and there was the kickoff and I was running as hard as I could. And, and I just remember this particular time going down the sidelines. And I know it doesn't look like I can run fast today, but back then I could run a little bit faster. And, and I just thought to myself, I'm going to tackle the person who caught the ball. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes a person whose job it was to make sure that I was not the person <laughs> to tackle the person who caught the ball. And I remember getting hit, blindsided, lit up. And all of a sudden, my hopes, my dreams of being the person that tackled the person who caught the ball were just utterly destroyed. Anybody have an experience like that? You were just blindsided. You thought you were going in a particular direction. 
You thought things were running smoothly in project or on a life or in school or in family. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you've been blindsided and you don't know how to recover. This morning, as we open back up our scriptures, I'm reminded of where we've been in the book of Jude. And we, from the very beginning, we've been talking about being in this fight that we wouldn't be caught off guard, that we wouldn't be blindsided by things that can derail our faith, that we would uh, obviously experience circumstances, but that they would not get the last word because we would be, if you go back to our Winter Bible Conference, rooted and grounded in our faith in Jesus in such a way that even in the midst of dis difficult circumstances, we can continue to flourish as followers of Jesus Christ. We talk about from the very beginning, fighting for joy in a world of angst. Then we talked about fighting for faith in a world of doubt. Then we talked about fighting for truth in a world of confusion. Two weeks ago, we talked about fighting for righteousness in a world of rebellion. And this morning, I want to tell you that we're going to talk about fighting for growth in a world that desires to pull you back. Because the world thinks nothing of blindsiding you. And people will come in desiring to deceive you. And the question is, kind of like my old football coach would say, keep your head on a swivel. Are we going to be aware of the attack that we might dodge the hit and accomplish God's purpose for our lives? Let's go to our text this morning. Jude, beginning in verse 17, says this. But you, dear friends, remember that it was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you, he says, remember this was predicted. They told you in the end times there would be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions in our worldly, not having the spirit. He says, I don't want you to be caught off guard. I don't want you to be unaware. There's going to be people that are going to enter into the church. Remember, this isn't the church even in our day and time, but this was the early church and it is continuing to happen into our day and time. There's going to be people that are going to come into the church and the teaching is going to be false and their desire is to destroy your faith. But you... But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who waver, save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. So Jude is wrapping up this short letter, but deep letter, and he's wanting to give the church of his time and our time truth to hold on to that our faith would not be derailed. And so the very first thing he tells the church is that they need to remember the warnings that the apostles in Jude's time, they need to remember the warnings that Peter, that John, that Paul, that James, they need to remember the warnings about false teachers coming in with a desire to derail and to destroy the church. He says, but you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ and what Jude is actually trying to convey to the church in his time because I think that it's really easy to sit before a worship service like we do, in buildings like we do. And by the way, it was really easy in Jude's time to hear people talk about Jesus and to get really excited about that and to think, well, they're talking about Jesus and 
So I love Jesus and they love Jesus. Therefore, we're in complete alignment and agreement on everything. I'm gonna go ahead and let you know this. I don't think I've ever read a book. I don't think I've ever lived, listened to a pastor that I have agreed with 100%, all right? But what Jude is not talking about is minor disagreements. You may not disagree with me 100%. That's okay. My wife doesn't agree with me 100%, all right? So, so there you have, you have that permission, right? But those, there's, there's agreement on major things and agreement on minor things. And so what Jude is conveying to the early church is that there are going to be people and it's not going to be little things that they're going to be disagreeing about, but these are going to be major doctrinal issues that are going to derail the faith of the church, ultimately with the aim of destroying the body of Christ. And so he's reminding the early church that the presence of false teachers is absolutely certain. That there are people out there who might be popular in the world's eye and might even be popular in certain Christian circles who are going to be described in this passage who do not truly teach God's word, but only have a desire to lift up their own name and to build their own kingdom, to derail your faith and to destroy God's true church. See, the presence of false teachers is absolutely certain. The enemy is willing to do all that he can to fight against our spiritual growth. And sometimes what works best is an outright lie, but sometimes, as Jude is conveying in this passage, what actually works best is a little lie. A little lie that has devastating consequences. Sometimes teaching can sound really, really close to the truth and yet not be the truth. Does that matter? I want you to consider these things. If you were going somewhere and you were off course by just one degree, after one foot, you'd miss the target by 0.2 inches. That's pretty trivial, right? But what about as you go further out? After 100 yards, you'd be off by 5.2 feet. Not a huge deal, but noticeable. After a mile, you'd be off by 92.2 feet. One degree is now starting to make a difference. If you were traveling from San Francisco to LA, you'd be off by six miles. But if you were traveling from San Francisco to Washington, DC, you'd end up in Baltimore. No comments about either Washington, D.C. or Baltimore <laughs> needed. If you were taking a rocket to the moon, you'd be off by 4,169 miles, nearly twice the diameter of the moon. And if you were going to the sun, you'd miss it by 1.6 million miles, nearly twice the diameter of the sun. Traveling to the nearest star, you'd be off course by four. 141 billion miles. In that span, you could get from the earth to Pluto 120 times. Over time, one degree of air can really wreck the course of our life and make a huge difference. Another way of putting it, and I like this one pretty well, rat poison can be 99% real food. But the 1% that's not can kill you. Does what we believe make a difference? Yes. So Jude tells the early church to remember, be aware, be on guard. And then he paints this picture of false teachers. How do we know what a false teacher really looks like? And what Jude wants to say is that the picture of a false teacher is incredibly clear. This is what it says beginning in verse 18. 
They told you, the apostles told you. In the end times, there will be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are worldly and they do not have the spirit. There's some really interesting terms in here, but we'll just go ahead and break it down. The first term that Jude uses is scoffers. I know that's in your everyday vocab, but we'll kind of paint a picture of what a scoffer is because at least for me, it's not. See, the word scoffer is a person who mocks or treats God's word or the things of God or the people of God with contempt. Did you catch that? A scoffer is a person who mocks and treats the word of God, the things of God, and the people of God with contempt. They mock the authority of the word of God. They mock the people doing the work of God. They mock the church and their worship of God. That's a scoffer. In Psalm chapter one, we find the same word. It says, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sinners or sit in the company of scoffers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord, his instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He says that we're to have nothing to do with people who deny the authority of God's word. We're to have nothing to do with people who mock the things of God. We're to have nothing to do with people who despise the people of God. They're scoffers, Jude tells us. The second thing that he tells us is that these same people are sensual. When we're reading in Jude, He says it this way. They told you in the end times there would be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. That there would be people, I know this surprises you, that would live completely for themselves and their own pleasure. That they are sensual people. And here's what a sensual person is. A sensual person is a person who chooses easy over godly. An essential person is a person who chooses what feels good over what God says is good. Amen. Jeremiah chapter six, verse 16 says this, thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it. For there you will find rest for your souls. But they said, the sensual people said, we will not walk in it. They don't want to walk according to the ways of God. They don't want to walk according to the word of God. They don't have a desire to walk alongside the people of God. They simply have a desire to derail and destroy. They're sensual caring about themselves and not about the Lord and his people. The second thing I'd point out to you about sensual people is that sensual people have an appetite which cannot be satisfied. They're always wanting more. You find a person who's always wanting more, who is never satisfied, you're finding a sensual person. Isaiah chapter 56 verses 11 through 12 says, the dogs have a mighty appetite. I have a mammoth golden doodle. He's a dude. His name is Zeus, by the way, and he fits his name. We picked him out because he was the biggest dog in the litter. And guess what? We've kept up with some of the other parents of these dogs. He's the biggest dog in the litter. He is gigantic. You know what my gigantic dog doesn't refuse? Treats. As a matter of fact, when you put a bowl of food in front of him, he will devour it and then come to you and look at you with puppy dog eyes as if to say, I am still hungry not saying he's a bad dog. He's a good dog. And that's okay for a dog, but that's not okay for God's people. These sensual people, they're never satisfied. They never have enough. And Isaiah says, but they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each according to his own gain. Did you hear his own way? not according to God's word, according for his own gain, desiring to build up his platform or build up his reputation. And it's not just the pastors in the pulpit, but the people in the pews all have the propensity for this kind of living. 
come, they say, let me get wine. Let us fill ourselves with strong drink. Tomorrow will be like this day, great beyond measure. Desiring only self-gratification. The next thing Jude says is that the person who would lead the church astray, they're schismatic. I love that word. Schismatic means they cause division. There's multiple ways to cause division in a church, but these false teachers, they're schismatic. They'll go about it whatever way is necessary in order to get the result they want to derail, to divide, and to destroy. I love 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse one. It says, be imitators of me as I am imitators of Christ. Listen to me, church. Schismatic people are always looking to see who's following them rather than checking to see if they are following Christ. See, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Schismatic people don't really care if they're following Christ. They care about how many retweets they're getting and likes they're getting. Look, look at me. They're looking behind and not looking where they're going. In Galatians, it says this, for in Christ, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, having put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Schismatic people play favorites and treat others as less than rather than elevating everyone as brothers and sisters in Christ. So the first thing that you see, a person who will cause division is looking at who's following them rather looking at the one that they're following. The second thing that you see from a person who would cause division, they play favorites. Well, you, you, you qualify. You're these kind of people. You're my kind of people. It was really funny. I was walking back before service and I, I told Tyler, um, our, our production director, I said, I'm, I'm looking for my people. And he said, don't say that. We're all your people. What I really meant is that I was looking for Ryan and Melanie J because I didn't think that Ryan was going to pick on me when he was up here. (laughs) I was just making sure they were in the room and ready to go. I'm not playing favorites. That has no room in the church. It's not about who you are or where you've come from. It's about who we are, one in Jesus. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're equal before Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, it says, For one will say, I follow Paul, and another will say, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos, and what then is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Schismatic people care more about being recognized and getting credit than seeing that God gets the glory. And the final thing that it tells us about these people who seek to divide the church, to derail and to destroy God's people, is he says, there they are spiritless. I want you to hear this church family, there's supposed to be a supernatural camaraderie between the children of God. You ever meet someone who just loves Jesus like you love Jesus? It doesn't even really matter where you meet them. You can meet them in the Walmart on wards. You can meet them overseas on a mission trip. But in an instant, you know you are a brother or sister to me. It should look like that within the body. But there are people who desire to cause the body's downfall. And a question we ought to be asking is, do we feel closer in our walk with God because we have spent time with someone and under their teaching or further away from God? And what Jude is telling the church is that we ought to have nothing to do with these people. How do we fight against people who are like this, who seek to pull us down and to divide and to derail and to destroy our faith? How do we do that? And here's the message that Jude gives. He says, remain in God's love. Verses 20 through 23 say this, but you dear children, but you dear friends, as you build yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, 
waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who waver. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So when he says remain in God's love, what Jude is really charging the church to do and each individual as followers of Jesus Christ in the church to do is be incredibly serious to be incredibly intentional about growing spiritually. Think about John chapter 15, where Jesus paints the picture of abiding in Christ. I am the vine and you are the branches. Remain in me and you will bear much fruit. What it looks like to grow in our faith is first and foremost, abiding in Christ. What does the person who is abiding in Christ look like? Just like Jude wants to paint the picture of the false teacher, Jude wants to paint a picture and a challenge for the church of what it looks like to truly keep ourselves, to remain in, to abide in the love of Christ. And the first thing he says is that we ought to be people who are constantly growing in the scriptures. He says, but you yourselves, or build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Build yourselves up in the most holy faith. He's talking about being the church, being built up on God's word. God's word is God's authority. God's word is God's standard. God's word is our nourishment and God's word directs our lives. Here's what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. A so familiar passage, but one that we often forget. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Pause. Do I, as a follower of Jesus want to accomplish God's purpose and his will for my life and my church. Not even meaning to be rhetorical. Do I, as a follower of Jesus, genuinely want to accomplish God's purpose for my life and see God's purpose come to fruition in my church? You can go like this, if you're still listening. Go like this, you're like, I don't, I don't care. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy, that the man or a woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good purpose that through God's word, he equips his body to accomplish his purpose. There are so many people out there today who are gathering around in churches going, I don't know what God wants to do in my life. And the problem is, is that for the majority of them, the real reason that they don't know what God wants to do in their life is they haven't opened up God's word to listen to him. Do we really want it? We say this on Sunday, but then we go with this on Monday. He says, grow in the scriptures. The second thing is grow, growing in prayer, praying in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean to pray in the Holy Spirit? I believe praying in the Holy Spirit looks like this, praying in agreement with God and his word, praying as prompted by the spirit when he prompts you, praying in faith, believing that God can accomplish what you're praying for and praying with power because we understand that God has planted his spirit in us. The same spirit that Christ raised Christ from the grave. The same spirit which the word says, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world is the same spirit by which we pray. Do we believe there's power? In Ephesians, it says that we believe that God is able to do exceedingly more, far and above, way beyond all that we could ask and imagine, and yet we don't pray like that. Pray like the whole, in the Holy Spirit. It says grow in personal holiness. Check this out, holy faith, holy spirit, and love our God are intimately connected in this passage. 
There's a holiness aspect that ought to be lived out in our lives. We ought to care that when people look at us, that they're rece- or they are seeing a reflection of who Jesus is. That we would grow in personal holiness. How does it relate? In John 14, 15, it says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Check this out, church. If we love God, we will walk in his ways. If we love God, we will walk in his ways. That doesn't mean we won't stumble and fall, all right? That doesn't mean we're not going to sin. That doesn't mean we won't mess things up. What it does mean is that we, when prompted by the Holy Spirit, when he convicts us of the sin that is in our lives, we will ruthlessly deal with it and cut it out. Grow in your personal holiness. Is there sin in your life? Confess it, not just to the Lord. Confess it to a brother or sister who can hold you accountable to what you are dealing with, that they can pull you along, push you along, prompt you along. Some of them just kick you along. Because I so much want to look like Jesus that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get rid of the sin that doesn't glorify him. Grow in watchfulness. I love this verse. Waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Maranatha. You know, the older I get, the more comfortable I get saying that word. Maranatha. All that word means is come, Lord Jesus. We sit on the other side of a week where our nation is once again been devastated by violence. Maranatha. When we see the brokenness of our world and long for Jesus coming to restore all things to himself, to take what we've broken and to make it whole again. Do we wait with eager expectation on God's return? I think about Logan sitting at home while I'm sitting in my office on a particular day and one of his toys breaks. When will dad be home? Five minutes goes by. When will dad be home? Minute and a half goes by because he has no concept of time. When will dad be home? Mandy's getting frustrated, but he doesn't care. When will dad be home? Asked on repeat until I finally pull in the driveway. Daddy, he exclaims, and rushes out our screen door with his brokenness in his hands. Will you fix this for me? That's what it means to wait expectantly for the Lord to come. That we look at the brokenness that is around us and say, Jesus, when will you come back? Here's this brokenness. I cannot fix it. But one day, I am confident. As confident as a three-year-old who does not know his father's skill set yet. (laughs) That my brokenness will be healed. The good news is, church, we do know the Father's skill set. And he is able to heal our brokenness. And Jesus is coming back. Maranatha, Lord, come. Grow in grace. Says this, and beginning in verse 22, have mercy on those who waver. That means to deal gently with those who are struggling with the faith. Maybe they're doubting. We don't go to people who are doubting, go, how could you do that? How could you believe that? How could you think that? No, we deal gently with them. My brother, my sister, I love you. Let me show you what God's word says. Let's go and look at what other scholars have said about this. I don't deal with you with harshness. I deal with you with God's love and grace. For I recognize what it says in Romans, it's your kindness, Lord, that leads me to repentance. 
I'm not going to beat somebody back into God's kingdom. No, it is mercy. That mercy that I desire. That mercy that's new every morning that draws me into deeper, more meaningful faith and belief. Have mercy on those who waver. Deal gently with those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Deal quickly with those who are in danger. When we recognize people that are walking away from the faith church family, let me just go ahead and break this to you. You are going to notice people wavering and walking away from the faith far more quickly than I will. In your life groups, why is it so important to be a part of a life group? Because there's a family that is there that can encourage you in the faith and when you start to waver, they can pull you back in. Picking up the phone phone and simply saying, hey, I miss you. Shouldn't do that motion anymore. It's like picking up the phone and simply saying, hey, I miss you. Just a word. Snatching people from the fire with great urgency because Jesus is the great shepherd who leaves the 99 to go after the one and we ought to be the same way. Deal carefully with those who are defiled. This is what it says, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Be careful that you don't fall into the same trappings and setting aside those who go on to live according to the world, going... There needs to be repentance. There needs to be repentance. The final thing that Jude leaves us with is this, to grow in worship. The end of Jude says this, now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time now and forevermore. Amen. What Jude actually ends with is a song of praise. It's a doxology. And we say doxology in a Baptist church, you only recognize one that you sung growing up. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But to end with a doxology is to end with a moment of reflection and worship. This was meant to be sung in the early church. It's meant to be sung through our lives as well. And what Jude is telling the early church is that we must grow in worship. We must fight for worship. There are going to be other things claiming to be of utmost importance that so easily creep into our lives. And we must regularly and ruthlessly protect our time of worship. How will we fight against the false teachers, the scoffers, the schismatic, the sensual, How will we stand a chance? Church, we'll stand a chance if we lock arms in the spirit and we grow. Abide in Jesus, grow in his word, grow in prayer. Abide in Jesus, walk according to his ways in personal holiness. Abide in Jesus. Go after the people that are falling. Abide in Jesus. Hold tightly to the time that God gives us to worship. Abide in Jesus. That is the way. Father God, I come to you this morning and just thank you for this time, God, that we have to grow in your word together. We thank you for the book of Jude and the challenges of the message, God, that we would not allow in people who decide to divide and derail and destroy our faith, God, but that we would abide in you more fervently, greater desire for your word, for prayer, for one another, that we would walk according to your ways, that we would hold up snatch out of the fire those who are walking away. God, that we would love people as you love them. God, that we would be people, not just of your word personally, but people who worship you together, knowing that there is strength as the body of Christ gathers, that we encourage one another. 
and are emboldened to live out the faith before a world who desperately needs the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is their only hope of salvation and eternal life. Father God, in the time that we have, I recognize that this was a gauntlet, but it's one that we were meant not to just run through, hoping to avoid the blows, but to receive the blows and to question, God, does this look like me? And then if not, to come in a spirit of repentance, to trust you, to say, God, I haven't been growing in this way. Lord, will you help me as I leave here this morning? Surround me with brothers and sisters of faith who will encourage me in my walk with you this morning. God, I believe you've given us the body of Christ here at Highland Heights. I'm thankful for it. We are not perfect. We're far from it. But I believe Jude doesn't desire to call us into perfection. What he desires to call us in is to pursuit. Pursuit of you. So in the time of response, as the altars are open, God stir in my heart, in our hearts, that we would pursue you in greater ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's stand together. Let's worship together as we respond this morning. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself
We're glad that you're able to join us today. Uh, if you're a visitor with us, we're excited that you're here. We'll hope that you'll join us again. But one of the easiest ways to get connected and uh, really take some of your first steps in becoming a part of the family here at Highland Heights is just to fill out the connect card that you can find in the back of the seats in front of you. It's a small QR code. You can find uh, plenty of information there and information about all the events and different things that happen here at Highland Heights as well. Uh, I've got three announcements for you. It's coming up on Easter, so I figured, you know, three uh, since Jesus was in the grave for three days. And then uh, I'm going to invite Pastor Josh up here to tell us a little bit about the Easter weekend so that he can celebrate the resurrection for us. Sound good? Uh, so number one, first announcement for me is going to be April 11th. We're getting ready to send our Church 56 students off for a spring break trip. And it's gonna be an awesome opportunity for them to spend time building relationships together, but to grow in their relationship with God as well. There's four spots remaining for that trip. So if you wanna get signed up, uh, make sure to check out, again, that QR code. It's gonna have all the information that you need. Uh, the 16th is the deadline for our Cindy Metter scholarship applications. So for those of you who may not know, we actually uh, have a scholarship fund that helps to support people who are pursuing full-time ministry, who are members here at Highland Heights. Uh, and help them to be able to go to college and to go get a seminary degree as they walk forward in a way that God has called them to. So if you're working on an application or anything along those lines, they're due on the 16th. And then the 21st of April, there's a women's ministry craft night. Uh, I hear that we're going to be making some door hangers. Uh, and I say we, but it's obviously not me. Uh, I might swing by though. I'm going to be up here on the 21st. And I feel like the, uh, the, the flower option for what we're hanging on the doors sounds pretty cool. We might need one of those for our house. So uh, maybe somebody can just make one for me and I can swing by and pick it up. But it's going to be a fun night, opportunity for people to... Uh, you know, have some dinner together, have dessert, uh, paint, and do a few other things. And the cool thing about the 21st is that if you have kids who are either fifth grade through eighth grade, uh, we've got something going on in the student ministry at the same time. We're going to have a Cowboys versus Aliens laser tag night. So uh, yeah, that's where I'll actually be, but I'll definitely swing by and grab a flower. <laughs> um, you can drop them off. It's the same time, same details pretty much. So you're welcome to um, use this as an opportunity for your family to have some engagement with the church and, and with each other here as well. So lots of cool things that are happening. Uh, I want to remind you as well just to make sure that you uh, take a chance to think about ways that you might give to support the mission here and the vision that God has for Highland Heights. Um, we do so many cool things and we have so many opportunities to affect people with the gospel. Uh, one of those is what's happening this weekend. So Pastor Josh, you want to share a little with us? Jackson, I got to go from Cowboys and Aliens to Easter weekend. Well, I just want to set you up like, that, that way on that, purpose. That's awesome. Normally, yeah. I love it. So although I, I might come and hang out because that sounds like fun too. Uh, listen, we are so excited about what has happening around here at Highland Heights uh, this Easter week. Uh, number one, you have cards on your seat. Please leave with those cards because guess what? They say Easter, they're not good for us the following week. All right. You need to take those with you so that you can find somebody this week to invite. Number two is we have a really unique opportunity on Good Friday. And so here's what that looks like. It's going to be kind of a contemplative time of worship, and you will want to show up sometime between 5 and 6.30. Does that mean you need to come at 5 o'clock? No, you can come at 5. You can come at 5.15. You can come at 5.45. You can come at 6, 6.15, 6.30. But sometime between 5 and 6.30, you're going to want to come because what you're going to have the opportunity to do is to have an interactive uh, kind of uh, prayerful, contemplative, a Good Friday experience, you're going to want to enter in either entrance three or entrance eight, and you'll come down to entrance three. And so each room is going to be set up different. In some rooms, you're going to have the opportunity to listen to a quick video. In other rooms, you're going to have the opportunity to read scripture, to pray. In some rooms, you're going to have the opportunity to do something that is going to be completely tactile. So yes, it is kids friendly, and you're going to want to come and be a part of that. The whole experience is going to last for about an hour. And so we'll group you in groups of 15, and we'll begin you guys together uh, through this interactive uh, Good Friday service. And so anytime between 5 and 6.30, you're going to want to arrive and plan for about an hour to complete uh, what is going on there on Good Friday night. The second thing is this, or the last thing is this, we have Easter. And I'm so excited about what God is going to do here at Highland Heights on Easter Sunday as we gather together and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So all week long, look for people to invite, plan to be here, pray that God would move. And with that, we'll say our memory verse for 
The last Let's remind time. you the, the details the for the Easter service, too, just oh, so we don't forget. It's a little bit different this, this coming Sunday than normal. So, so, so no, no life, life group, groups. No life group. Mm -hmm. We have two services that are completely identical, 930 and 11 o'clock. Yeah, we won't there have we any student activities, but we will have things for kids. So yes. first through sixth grade. Absolutely. Well, I guess every birth through sixth grade. That's right. Birth through sixth there grade. Go. There you go. Be going on during so, both of those services. Thank you for catching those details. Yeah, there you That's go. good. You got they it. probably wanted the information. So awesome. With that being said, let's go ahead and uh, read our memory verse from uh, this passage here in Jude. It's actually going to be um, the passage that we ended with uh, today. So it says this, Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Let's go make disciples this week, Highland Heights. <laughs>